The holidays are coming. Find a gift for someone special with jewelry from Blue Nile. Right now, Blue Nile is offering special Black Friday and Cyber Monday deals. Save up to 50% on the season's most stunning trends. Blue Nile offers an endless selection of bold gold styles, gemstone jewelry, and classic diamond pieces. And now, for a limited time, get 36 months special financing on minimum purchases of $1,000. Restrictions apply. See BlueNile.com for details. That's BlueNile.com. This episode is brought to you by Columbia Sportswear. It's snowing again, and that wind chill is killer. But you're not worried about that because you shop the Omni Heat Infinity Collection. It's warmth perfected with tiny gold dots that reflect your body heat inside and protect you from the cold outside. No snow or chilly temps can stop you now. Go out anyway. Shop the Omni Heat Infinity Collection now at Columbia.com slash infinity. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back up front when you use it to buy a new iPhone 15, AirPods, or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA member FDIC. Terms apply. Hello and welcome to 1865, the Nottingham Forest podcast. We are recording on a snowy Sunday morning, the day after Forest had a home defeat to Everton, which they lost by a single goal scored by Dwight McNeil in the second half. In truth, it was one of the most disappointing performances we've seen from the Reds for some time. Uh, it's one of those situations whereby... Losing against Brighton, it's not fun and we're second best, but you can accept it because Brighton are a better team. Um, Are Everton a better team than Forest? Not sure. And all you want is for the team to show desire, belief and a little bit of nous. And maybe all three of those were lacking a little bit. Anyway, if we talk about the teams uh, before we go over to the Marriott on the Midlands and Adam. So Forrest did make some changes. They had Odysseus in goal. Serge Aurier replaced Ola Aina at right back. And then we had Willie Bolly replacing Nia Carte at centre-half alongside Murillo with Harry Toffolo continuing at left-back. In midfield, Ryan Yates came in for Nico Dominguez alongside Mangala and Sangare. And then up front, Gibbs White and Alanga were flanking Chris Wood. Now, um, Adam, just to come to you first, obviously emotions were running high after, you know, it's a cold evening it was one of those whereby people were feeling justifiably a bit upset. There were boos at the final whistle. It's the morning after now. Give me a sense of how you're feeling. Yeah, I think especially with our um, group chat and Twitter and a- any form of kind of opinion based things, I kind of thought I'm just not going to I'm not getting involved because I think the way I felt coming out of the ground, I just there's no productivity to come out of that. Uh, the booing at heart full time, it's one of them. I, I don't, I don't boo, and I never have. I didn't boo under Hewitt or Martin O'Neill or anything like that. It's just not really. I just, I don't see it as a productive thing to do. But I get it. I completely get it because that was a pretty poor performance overall. I mean, Everton aren't a good side. You know, let, let, let's have that right. Then they're all gonna. They're they're a short dice side. They're organised. They're well drilled. You know, they'll. They'll do their jobs. They'll put in a solid away performance. But in the end, that was enough for them to get three points. So frustrated is how I'm feeling this morning. Very frustrated. Married on the Midlands, do you think that Steve Cooper got the team selection wrong? Um, Not really. I think, I think we looked at it before the match and it, it looked like a, a decent selection. I think I've I've had the feeling in the last few weeks that we've been maybe miss, missing a bit of nous in there, a bit of experience, a bit of a steady head. So I was glad to see Willie Bolly back in there. Um, and you knew it was going to be a really tough physical game. So it, it made sense to stick in a Ryan Yates uh, in there as well, into midfield. Um, so I don't, I don't think it was necessarily a, a terrible selection. It was, I think it was designed to counteract the strengths that Everton had. Um, now there's always an argument whether you should play to your own strengths or 
or look to the, the opposition. So that, that's a debate you can always have. But I, I didn't look at it and think that was a terrible team. I was, I was pretty confident pre-match. And um, it's worth pointing out that, um, you know, Everton did have the better chances uh, in the first part of the game. So uh, there was a moment where... Uh, where where Beto, the ball broke to him and after, frankly, a flappy moment by Odysseus um, and Beto tried to lift it past Bolly and Odysse- the recovering goalkeeper and he lifted it, you know, high and it was it was a poor finish from someone who's, who's a centre forward. And then uh, Dwight McNeil um, got through after good work from Decore, but that was after Forrest had given the ball away. And McNeil did everything right, actually. He had enough time and space. He picked his spot. Um, Murillo was heroic in getting back and clearing it off the line via the post. And at that moment, it was one of those situations where we were being quite overrun, weren't we? Um, so, married on the Midlands, um, with Everton getting those chances, it felt like we are getting a little bit overrun, didn't it? And, yeah, were you fearing for Forrest's progress um, at those times? Yeah, I mean, in the first five, ten minutes, I thought we did quite well. We were knocking the ball around around nicely and we had good control possession. But it's they just Everton were trying to hit it long and they were sort of negating our midfield. So um we were always a little bit on the back foot. And then a couple of injuries occurred, uh, with both Bolly and Murillo picking up sort of strains or pulls or something. And that really upset the rhythm for Forrest. Um they they were fairly simple sort of passes which were they didn't normally intercept without any problem. It suddenly became really difficult for especially Willie Bolly to um, get to. He's just like the ball was just a few yards away in at one point and he just couldn't run to get there. So I think that really sort of disrupted us more than anything else. Um, there's sort of the, the, the midfield players were having to drop back a bit further and uh, trying to help them out, so that that really created a massive hole in midfield. I felt, and then just uh, there was just a huge sort of chasm in there, which really contributed to us, us losing control. Yeah, and 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 on that topic as well. So obviously Yates came in. He's basically playing the uh, Dominguez role on the left of the three central midfielders with Mangala holding and Sangare on the right. Um, I did notice that there was a slight. Um, not quite formation change, but a slight change in approach um, because we're getting so overrun in midfield. About halfway through the half, um, Cooper did um, make Sangare sit in a little bit more with Mangala and it gave Yates the licence to go a little bit further forward. So we looked quite lopsided in the kind of forward part of it, but it gave Forrest a little bit more control, bearing in mind that Jimmy Garner was in danger of of, of running the midfield show. Don't you agree, Maradona? Yeah, he, he was outstanding. Um, I think we also looked a little bit lopsided because I think the plan was for uh, Morgan Gibbs White to keep on coming central to allow Aurier to get forward and, and provide the width on the right hand side. But but Serge just didn't manage to get forward really at all in that first half. I can only really remember one cross. Um, so that there was a big space there. Um, with Sangari and, and Mangala both sort of sitting there, it, it's, a, it's still, I, I think, didn't really work for us. It, it, it meant that we couldn't really get into their phases. We, we weren't able to use Ryan Yates's normal uh, attributes of going after people and putting them under pressure and harrying them and, and pressing them. He looked, although he, he looked, didn't quite look his usual self. Um, so, yeah, it was it was difficult. But by the end of the half, we we were more back in the game again. But there's a, a good sort of 15, 20 minutes or so, or so right in the middle of the first half where it was all Everton. Mm, mm. And then um, Adam Forrest did have a couple of, uh, well, I mean, we call them chances, and Steve Cooper bemoaned Forrest not hitting the target. Um, Alanga got the ball coming across to him on the left hand side, and he tried to curl it in, but it went wide. And then Gibbs White had a chance late on where the ball was played out to him on the right hand side. He had time and space to 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 shoot, but rather than uh, cutting across the ball and going for the far stick, he ended up going for the near post and and hitting it wide. Um, when you're not making many chances, you probably need to be hitting the target with those, don't you, Adam? Yeah. So uh, we sit behind the goal. So for us, it was we we hit, see him at the shot. He's gone near post and he's then hit the back of the net or back off the advertisement board. So we thought it was in. So we sort of turned around and you have like that split second where it was like, oh, it's in. Um, looking back at the chance, he probably just needs to go across the goalkeeper. But again, I think this is kind of a running theme throughout a lot of players that we're going to talk about is that 
I don't know that there's a lot of confidence at the minute. I don't know that there's that confidence in their own ability to say, right, let's, you know, like to make those right decisions to think I need to go across the goalkeeper or to think maybe I should take this a little bit differently. I, I don't know that there's that confidence at the minute. And that is a really hard thing to get over. I think the one thing I will say is that this time last year, we were having a pretty similar conversation about the team looking defeated, about the team looking you know, devoid of any confidence whatsoever. And then we somehow found a way to start winning games. It just takes a little bit of that. But at the minute, it's just, it's a bit of pain to go through. Yeah. And we will return to that theme a little bit later on. So, um, it was uh, a situation, uh, Maradona, you'd alluded to Bolly and Murillo both uh, looking, <laughs> frankly, a bit knackered. Um, and so it was a little bit of a surprise uh, to see Murillo come out, but Bolly didn't make it for the second half. Were you surprised that he chose Felipe as the defender to come on, bearing in mind that Yates was taking time to get back up to speed, um, Aurier had his, had his moments. Was it a surprise to bring in another player who maybe hadn't played much recently? Not really. I, I think the, one of the reasons for bringing in Bolly was because he, he would have been a steady head next to Murillo. And I think that's that fits the bill for Felipe. Um, Nikati's a little bit rash sometimes. And maybe he just need a little break um, from the first team just to sort of compose himself and get his performances get going again. Uh, so, no, I wasn't really particularly surprised by that. And then with Felipe, he also brings that composure on the ball as well, same as Murillo. So, can can help with sort of building up attacks and, and, and so on. So, and yeah, I was, I was quite happy to see him come back on. Although I would point out that Felipe, his his first few contributions were, in fact, passes which were directly to the opposition. So there's yeah. a bit of ring rustiness there. Um, Adam, I mean, I... Near Carte was dropped, and I suspect that one of the one of the reasonings for that was because with having two left footers in the back in the back four, it kind of meant that the back four looked a little bit imbalanced. So, do you reckon that's also part of the reason why Felipe was chosen ahead of the uh, the Senegalese? Potentially, I think there's also that kind of the theme of Felipe being probably at one of our best defenders last year, and Felipe was absolutely magnificent from the minute he was brought in till the end of the season last year. So I think Steve Kubler probably thinks, well, I owe him a little bit of something for how good he was last year. But I think for me, he just, I don't know how he looks in training. Of course, none of us do, but he didn't look anywhere near fit, in my opinion. He, he, I think he's completely lost a yard of pace. I think that, I mean, let, let, let's be honest, I mean, he's 34 years old. He's not going to be, you know, he's not going to be as sprightly as he once was, but I, I don't think he looks anywhere near the level that was required last night. I don't think, I don't think he adapted to the speed of the game. I think he looked very, very poor. And I don't think I've ever said that about him before because I don't think that that's characteristic of him. But it, it's one of those in hindsight things. As an in hindsight, yes, it was the wrong decision to bring him on. You should have brought Nia Carte on because Nia Carte, for all his faults, is athletic, is pacey. And irregardless of the fact that he's a left footer, I think he was probably the better choice. Uh, Felipe looked completely lost when he came on and to be honest I think he was fairly lucky that he got booked and then had a couple of fouls after that and the ref was fairly lenient because some refs wouldn't have been yeah. and he kept committing fouls and he kept doing the silly little pulls of the shirt the silly little like you know tap of the ankles and stuff and I think he was quite lucky in the end to actually finish the game yeah, I mean, there's a, there's an argument. He certainly deserved that first yellow card, um, which came not very long after he'd, he'd, he'd entered the fray. Um, and there was an argument that he should have had a second yellow um, later on in the half, which uh, the Everton captain, James Tarkovsky, uh, did try and make the points gently to the referee. Um, and I think he probably was a little bit lucky on another day. It might have gone against him. The other moment that Filippo was involved in was when... Forrest played a corner into the box from Toffolo. Uh, it went across the box. Alanga tried to fire it back across. It came back across to Felipe, and Felipe actually hit the post. Um, he just had a slash at it and hit the post. Uh, married on the Midlands, it was only after that precise moment that I realised what all the fuss was about, because uh, when you look at it again... The referee has a very clear view of Abdullah Dekore pulling Ryan Yates' shirt and legging him up in the process. How did he not give that? And then how did VAR not give that? Yeah, I mean, when it happened, I, I didn't think it was a penalty, sort of watching it live, because it just like one of those usual shenanigans that goes on in the box. But for VAR 
to not give it. I'm I'm wondering if that it was a consequence of Steve Steve Cooper having a go at them giving the uh, one against us last week so easily. And I said, well, I will show you. You don't think that's a penalty? Well, this isn't a penalty either, but it was a it was a definite penalty. And um, I'm having watched sort of match their day and things, and the and the pundits they're all sort of unanimous in their decision. I, I didn't want to sort of think initially that it was because I thought maybe it's just my own forest bias thinking that, but it has confirmed me. And then and the, trying to trip Ryan Yates up, that sort of put the uh, cherry cherry on the icing on the cake there. It, it, it was a definite penalty and, and who knows how the match would have gone if we'd been given that. Yeah, it was nil-nil. And and for all of Morgan Gibbs-White, there was some conjecture in our in our group chat about you know the performance levels of Morgan Gibbs White, but but Adam, I would I would I would back him to score a penalty uh, ninety nine times out of hundred, and that would have probably given us a lead that we didn't really deserve in a match where the first goal was always going to be important. I think the longer the match went on, I think most people felt it was going to be a one goal game. You know, it, it, one nil either side wins it. So it would have been massive. It, it was a penalty. And I'm a bit, you know, a bit the same there that from when we first saw it, especially because of where I sit, it, I, I didn't didn't think anything of it. And the appeal, to be, to be fair, wasn't actually as passionate as you would have probably expected it to be because it, I, I don't think anyone saw it potentially. I mean, that's probably what it was. But it is definitely a penalty. If VAR are looking at that, they've got to give it. I, I, I don't understand how they haven't given it. Steve Cooper's criticism of the VAR system of the referees and all that is completely warranted. The standard of officiating in this league is, isn't good enough. And it's a standard that we need to improve. You watch a Champions League game, for example, and you watch the officiating in the Champions League, the way the VAR works in the Champions League, there's no reason we can't do that in the Premier League. There's no reason we can't have that standard of officiating. So it, it's bound to annoy Steve Cooper and it's bound to frustrate us as fans. And Maradona, I guess the rationale is that, you know, Howard Webb said we don't want VAR to be re-refing the incident, but VAR said there wasn't enough contact to warrant a penalty. So he's saying there was no clear and obvious error. If VAR had sent Paul Tierney over to the monitor, surely Tierney would have given given the spot kick. Yeah, I think so. It's um, so it's the ref's decision to make, really, yeah. isn't it? It's not re-refing. It's just saying, it's just, have a look at it, mate. Yeah, it's just. It, I, I mean, you you know that I hate VAR, and I, I was dead against it ever coming in. Um, so it's it, it it's just one opinion on top of another opinion, on top of another opinion. So it, it just. It's just never going to work in a game like football, and I just there's so many inconsistencies in the way they they um, they use it. It's just the game against Wolves earlier on in the week, get Wolves against Fulham. They they sent him over. They didn't think it was bad enough for one decision, but they then sent him over to the other one, and yeah. it was wrong on both occasions. It was the other way, the other way around. So it just it just doesn't make any sense the way they use it. And but it's, also, it's like an arbitrary decision. But also, is there an argument that refs are running scared now and and Tierney might have given the spot kick if it wasn't for the fact that he was relying on VAR to send him to the monitor if it was a spot kick? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the pressure involved with making those decisions and running the VAR is immense because you've got the scrutiny of literally millions of people watching you. So it, it's an incredibly difficult job to do under pressure at that time. Uh, within sort of 10, 20 seconds to make a decision. People make errors um, under pressure. Um, it's another reason why I think they shouldn't bother, bother using it. Just let let it go as it was, in the opinion of the referee on the pitch. And if he doesn't see it, he doesn't see it. If he sees it, he sees it. Then at least we, we've got, you know, consistency in that sense. Whereas somebody, I mean, the idea of VAR was it, it cuts out the bias towards big clubs and cuts out obvious errors and things. <laughs> That's working well then. <laughs> it's not working. It's just, it's just, and it costs them. I think when it first started, it was fifty thousand pounds a game gets paid to the PGM or PGMOL mm. to have VAR, and it's just not value for money, is it? For 50, that, why, why? What's what? What's it add to the game? Nothing. Yeah, that's that's an eye-watering figure. Um, just to go back to the action. Um, so Forrest made a substitution, and they. They did bring on Callum hudson Adoy. He came on for Ibrahim Sangare. It meant that Yates dropped back in and we went to a 4-2-3-1 with Gibbs-White playing as a number 10. 
um, having been absolutely toothless up front, that was an attempt to remedy that. But before anything could happen from that, well, the visitors took the lead. And as we said, in a game where the first goal it increasingly looked like a single goal game, well, it went to Everton and it was from a free kick that was bundled into the box. Forrest defended the first ball OK, but the defending Adam from the second ball just really wasn't good enough, was it? And and it meant that McNeil, again, we'd had the warning in the first half and he had all the time and space. And, you know, he arrowed it into the top corner and, and, and gave gave Odysseus absolutely no chance. Yeah. Because, because uh, as I say, I sit behind the goal, I see that right in front of me. And we said to each other after it went in, I don't know how it's got to him. How has it got to that point? That, look, it's a good finish, right? We take nothing away from the finish. It's a great finish. You slammed it in the top corner. Nothing the goalkeeper can do about it. Although some people on Twitter might disagree with that, bizarrely, thinking he could have saved it. Yeah, I, I know. Okay. That face <laughs> says it all, mate. I've seen a lot of people online say he could have saved yeah. it. Don't know how he would have possibly saved that. I don't think any goalkeeper would. But yeah, it's it's the defending. It's the way that it drops to him. It's the way it's so easy. It's so easy to get to that point. And what frustrates you a little bit is that, and this is the bit probably I don't understand. And I don't think anyone can probably clear up at this point in time, is that I don't think we have bad personnel. It's not as if we've got players there that, oh, he's not good enough, he's not good. I don't think we've got bad defenders. I don't think we've got a team that should be conceding as many goals as we do. But then that happens and you just sit there and you just think, I don't I, I don't have the answer. How has the ball dropped to him? How has he got that opportunity to do that? And Dwight McNeil, for a, a lot of the stick he gets about the sort of player he is, he's got an absolute wand of a left foot. You don't, you don't want to give him a situation where you, you're putting him on his left foot to give him an opportunity to hammer it home. You, mm. you don't want that. I, I, and you've allowed that to happen. And, and it make, you just sit, sit there and you think like, how are we letting this happen? If they score from a wonder goal from 25, 30 yards out, that's not on anyone. If they score from a goal where you've let the ball drop to him in your box so close to the goal and you've let him hammer it home like that, it's it's multiple people's faults. You can blame one person. You can blame two people. You can say, oh, he should have been marketing. He should have been doing this. He should have been doing that. The truth of the matter is that two or three people should have been doing better with it. Yeah. And, and it's it's beyond frustrating. Yeah. And, and Maradona, I, sh- I share Adam's frustrations there um, in that there's enough experience in that back foot. I, I mean, in the immediate aftermath, I was pointing the finger a bit at Aurier. And, and I still... Stand by that. I, th- I think that Aurier should have taken a bit more control of the situation, not just his positioning, but the situation and getting Hudson Adoy to help him out and stuff like that. Well, but I mean, this has been something that has been common throughout the season. We've not dealt with the second ball. Well, no, I mean, the, the, I take it all the way back to um, Elanga not tracking the runner. He was standing next to the man, um, I think he's gay. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where, as soon as he let him run, I said, this is going to be a goal. Because uh, they, they had, all of a sudden they had an overload and we looked uh, a bit outnumbered. I wouldn't really necessarily blame any of the centre-halves because it, it was just too high for them. It was too high for, uh, but not, what's his name? Not Bebeto. What's his centre-four's name? Beto. Beto, yeah. <laughs> it was too high for him to get his head onto. But I wouldn't necessarily blame any of the centre-halves. You can maybe be, if you've been critical you can maybe say Aurier should have got out to him a bit quicker but it was just it was just a bit too high and it's just that initial initial letting him letting the runner run off him just left us outnumbered um but you've got to give Dwight uh credit as well that was a, an excellent finish I yeah. mean how often do you see players in that position blaze it wide blaze it over that was ex- sometimes you have to just say that was excellent uh technique and it, it, was a, it was a good goal, you know? Mm. Now, the thing that was common is that by that point, there had been no saves required um, from either goalkeeper. Um, Forrest did, as we've seen a few times, wake up later on in the game. And so we saw Alanga uh, make a break down the left-hand channel and Pickford came out. And that's one of the greatest pieces of goalkeeping I've seen in in, in a little while, actually, Um in terms of defensive goalkeeping. We also had late on Murillo made a one of his mazy runs, had a shot. And the thing that frustrated me about that wasn't that Pickford made the save down low to his left, but Hudson-Odoi 
you need your winger to be following up in that channel. And he was just stood a little bit too deep. And that I find that a little bit frustrating. So again, maybe a little bit of lack of sharpness and fitness there. Um, and, and then, you know, it was one of those where, I mean, Adam, you said it earlier, didn't you? The, the die was cast. I think we all knew that no matter what Forrest did, it was, it was, it was done. Yeah, this is, this was never going to be a classic of a game of football. It was going to be a a one goal ends it. I think I think that Murillo shot probably sums up the game, doesn't it? That we couldn't create an awful lot, so it took our centre half mm. to beat a man to get to the edge of the box and to lever it into the far corner for it to be saved, and then no one follow it up. It says a lot about how we were going forward last night because Murillo. I, I, I think we could we could probably record a whole podcast on Murillo because he, he if he stays there past this season, I'd probably be surprised because he looks unbelievable in the corner flag, taking on two players and, and, mm. and just spreading a fifty yard pass. I'm just like amazed that this this player is is ended up at Forest. Like he, he looks an absolute talent. And I said to someone next to me last night, I said, should we just play him up front? Or should we just play him as a ten? And he you're not you're not the anywhere. first you're not the first person. So in another um, group chat that Maradona and I are in, um, one of our forest friends said that. And, and Maradona, what was your response? So well, apparently he did start off as a as a striker and has gradually moved back to midfield and then to defence. But um, but he'd give maybe that presence that we've been lacking. Gave that presence. But the, the problem last last night was there was a massive gap between the midfield and Chris Wood. Um, he just left him completely isolated. Uh, Chris Chris Wood did go down with a sort of ankle problem early in the first half. Mm. I don't know if that sort of ha- hampered him for the rest of the match because he just he's not the most my mobile of players anyway. But really, really lacked movement last night and join, didn't join in with any sort of build up play whatsoever. Um, so it was, it was just him um, standing way up front. And then Alanga was probably the one bright spot in terms of attacking play. He sort of could run with it and carry the ball forward. And then Morgan gives White sort of centre on the right, sort of just made me try too hard at times. But there's yeah. such a gap. It, was, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't matter if it was up front yesterday. They wouldn't have got involved, I don't think. And it, and it says a lot that, um, you know, when Origi came on, um, bring, bringing, on top, bringing off Toff and bringing on Origi as the extra forward made absolutely no difference whatsoever, did it, Adam? No, but I, but that isn't that where you can maybe absolve that bit of blame from the manager because a, I, he's had a lot of stick online, right? But would you not look at that and say he did try to make the attacking change? He did try to bring mm-hmm. on an attacker for a defender. It, it's not as if that effort wasn't there to have us play a different way. The problem we've got at the minute, and it's what I put in our chat last night, for some reason, what Cooper wants to do isn't translated onto the pitch. He brings off a defender for an attacker and it changes nothing. It didn't change how we played. It didn't change the build-up play. It didn't change the channels we were passing the ball into. It changed very much nothing and it should have. And then you've got to ask yourself why. Why didn't it make the change? Why wasn't there a change when we actually changed completely formation? It, it, it really is, honestly, a, a confusing situation to be in. And I think the simple answer that people have taken to is it's the manager's fault. He got it wrong last night. I agree with, um, with what Maradona said at the start of this podcast, that when that lineup came out, I had no issue with it whatsoever. You see Ryan Yates in there for a bit of bite against an Everton team that's scrappy. The substitutions he made, I, again, maybe instead of Nia Carte for Felipe, but I think in general they were fine. And then when we went 1-0 down, he tried to change it to play more attacking. He tried to take off. He took off defender for an attacker. I think he tried. Why it didn't work is probably what we can be debating until next, the next game. Uh, we're not going to have enough time to do it on this one episode because I, I can't understand why nothing changed when the, the situation changed. You know what I mean? It, it's, it's one of those strange ones for me. Maradona. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you just have to say the players didn't play well. And um, there's, there's factors contributing to that. I think the lack of fitness in Aurier and Yates showed a bit. 
and they weren't their usual energetic selves and weren't getting around the pitch as easily as he, as he normally would. I think the illness that Sangare had showed, he, he wasn't quite as dynamic as he normally is. So there's all these factors contribute. Um, Callum Hudson, has, Callum Hudson Adoy, came on and he's working his way back to fitness. Um, and then there's just players just didn't play well. Toffolo didn't play well. He's the most tentative performance I've seen from him um, this season. Um, the injuries to Bolly and, and Murillo in the first half really hampered us. Um, and then Wood, Wood wasn't playing well. Sometimes you just don't play well. And that, that can happen. And that's, that's sort of the game plan that Everton have against a lot of teams, is to stop you playing well. And that, they, it worked for them. Sometimes you have to say that that is a contributing factor as well. Okie doke. So we'll um, we'll come back in a few minutes and we'll hear from an Everton fan. We'll also hear what Steve Cooper had to say and we'll continue this conversation. You're listening to 1865, the Nottingham Forest podcast. Why? Why? If you Why? have T-Mobile 5G home internet, you might be hearing this. Why? A lot. Why? Every time your internet slows down during the busiest hours. Why? Why? Because your network gives priority to cell phone users. Why? Why? Good question. Why not switch to Cox Internet with two times faster download speeds than T-Mobile 5G home internet during peak hours? Okay. Stop the whys and visit cox.com slash 5G home for details. T-Mobile prioritizes certain T-Mobile phone users over home internet users during times of congestion. It's the season for festive football. And what's the best way to watch it? Well, it's down at your local Green King Sports Pub, of course. After all, Christmas is a time to catch up with friends old and new. So get the team to your local for refreshing pints, delicious food and live action of every Christmas cracker. Every fixture from TNT, Sky and Amazon is live at Green King Sports venues. That means wall-to-wall action on the huge HD screens. Head to your local Green King and watch every winning goal, top bins volley and dodgy VAR decision in an atmosphere worth sharing. Ooh, that hurts. Download the Green King Sports app and you'll receive 10% off drinks every single time when there's sport on the telly. And what's more, you'll be supporting us here at the 1865 Nottingham Forest podcast. Now it's back to Maradona and Adam for the rest of the match report. The 1865 match report. Mike Richards from the Unholy Trinity Everton podcast. Delighted to to do a a clip post match today, that's for sure. Everton with the with a one nil win in it a bit of a scrappy game to be fair. Obviously we had the better of the the first half chances especially should have probably gone in one or two up. Um, second half was 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 fairly fairly scrappy and, and lacked a little bit of quality. But where the quality that was there was the the goal by by Dwight McNeil took it's particularly well. We've seen it time and time again last season. He's a great technician. Surprisingly, his first goal of the season, but I think one that will now allow him to to go and kick on and, and one that we are massively grateful for given what the what the Premier League has, has done to us. Um so if it wasn't for that we'd be sitting pretty in eleventh place as we speak now. Uh we feel we should be there but that's uh, another story. Uh but great for us to get the win. <clears throat> surprised by Forrest. Really surprised. You know, I, I went there last season myself and you know in, in a bit of an end to end game, two all draw, Forrest home record Last season, and you know that second half of the of last season was particularly good. So I expected a bit more of a of a rough ride. It's felt a little bit flat from a Forest perspective. Even even with the the fans as well, felt a little bit flat. Um, now whether that's because there's a lot of talk around the manager potentially being under pressure, uh, but yet there's quality there. You know, we we were in for a langer ourselves. Good player, obviously brought in Hudson the Doy. Um, you know, for me, Chris Wood's always a threat. He, he always has been against Everton. So. Um, from an, an attacking sense, I was, you know, Forest were a little bit, little bit um, flat as well. So, a little bit surprised. Obviously, delighted from our perspective. Happy to get the three points. I think Forest will be absolutely fine this season. Anyway, to be fair, I think, you know, we're, we're in a real battle because of the Premier League. I do feel that we will get some points back. But either way, you know, you've got the, the three sides who come up from the Championship and ourselves in in a battle. Um, Bournemouth potentially uh, dropping dropping in there as well, but Forest will be fine in around probably thirteenth, fourteenth. Ourselves, I think we'll get out of it. I think we've got we've got that quality to get out of it. We feel massively agreed by what's gone on as well. So sort of certainly uh, we feel totally galvanised as a club, as supporters, as players, and the manager and the coaching staff as well. 
So it's going to be it's going to be a, a tougher season for ourselves because of the the points deduction. But I feel we get out of it. I feel Forest will be fine as well, and hopefully, you know, when the home game comes around at Goodison Park, we're in a slightly better better place in the league as well. Okay, thank you to Mike from the Unholy Trinity Everton podcast. You can find them as they are stable mates on the Sports Social Network. Um, just to come back to that something that Mike alluded to there about the atmosphere and about the Forest performance. I mean, there were boos at full time, which is a rarity since since Steve Cooper's taken over. Um, Cooper did say, and we'll hear from him in a little while. There's no question of spirit, attitude or work right, just sometimes quality on the ball. And there'd been a whole host of responses on Twitter saying, not sure about that. I have to disagree. The attitude and, and lack of work rate was and desire was there. But, Adam, I'm going to come back to something that you said um, in the first half of this podcast, which was it's not belief or desire or work rate. It's confidence, isn't it? Forrester looking as lacking in confidence as we have seen probably since about Feb- January, February time. They just look completely deflated. Like, you know, the, I mean, Morgan Gibbs, why? I mean, you're worth staying off to it, out of social media if you like Morgan Gibbs, why? But because some of the abuse he's had is just, is just not on really. He still is probably our best player or at least one of our best players. You know, he hasn't played well, but, it's all confidence for me. I, I, it's no, there's no question of ability. And that's why you look at our team on paper and you look at some of the players we have and you think, why are we in the position we are? Well, it's a good question because there's no real reason why we're in the position we are other than, you know, like Maradona mentioned, it was just we didn't play well last night. Well, we didn't play well against Brighton either. We didn't play... Just, you know, there's a, There's been quite a few games where we haven't played well. So you've got to look for maybe a bit more of a an underlying theme of kind of, well, why is that? Why are we not playing well? And for me, it is just confidence. I can't see that these players believe in themselves at the minute. And and this is why I think that maybe calls of a manager change is a little bit silly because I just, I don't see that a manager change is going to change an awful lot. Um, the problems that we have are, you know, Cooper's not, you know, he, he needs to take some blame for what's happened. Of course he does. You know, let's not pretend like he's not going to take blame. He should, but it's not all his fault. And my, and my big problem at the moment is how do we get that confidence back? And one thing that we all have to remember and one thing we all have to acknowledge, he's done it before. He did it last season with a worse team. He did it last season. So he can do it. It's just about doing it now. And I'm going to come back to um, something that we've alluded to in in the past few weeks um which baz said in our group chat uh so maradona he's he's making the point that it feels like the new style that we're trying to implement that there's all this pressure for us to implement it lacks pace and intensity and that's that goes at odds with when we've seen the best from from cooper's forest over the last two years doesn't it yeah i mean well there, there just wasn't any apart from elanga there just wasn't a quick player in the team last night so it, it's hard to have pace in the team or play in a quick way if you don't have quick players in the team. Um, the loss of Brennan Johnson was always going to be a factor in that. And then it's it's okay when Tywo's playing because it's it's a similar situation to last season where we have two two quick players in the front line and they can get up and and uh, get boards together. Um, without Tywo in the team, we're always going to struggle. I haven't seen enough of Origi to see if he's he's quick enough. And I mean, I've been surprised by how big he is and as a as a as a man. I didn't realise watching. Um, him play for Liverpool in the past from afar that he was such a, a big physical player but for whatever reason he hasn't managed to get onto the pitch at the moment so maybe he carries some pace threat which we can maybe use against Fulham I don't know if he's fit enough to start uh, so it's going to be difficult to play with that pace if we just don't have any quick players um, with regards to the new style I, d- I think he had to try something because last season we had the worst away record in the Premier League uh, we won one game and drew four games. We had to tr- do something to um, address that away form. Um, the problem, the problem last season, we just gave the ball, ball away too much. So we had to try and retain possession in some way. And then it, the other thing I, that's occurred to me that it would be strange to have players like Sangari in the team now and Dominguez and tell them not to try and get on the ball to say play without the ball because you're good technical players. We can do, we've seen it. The thing I want to remind people is the game at West Ham was only two games away. The game against Villa was only three games away. 
So from being looking brilliant against Villa and looking really, really good against West Ham for huge periods, I say two games away. We we can't be on this roller coaster where we're looking amazing at one point and then we're all down in the dumps just because we lost a couple of games. We've got to be more of a steady long term view of these things. We just show we show we can play well with those technical players in midfield just a couple of games ago. So it will come again. You've just got to have a bit of patience. Okay. Let's hear what Steve Cooper had to say. Um, I've just got a little clip of him here. Um, try to think about, you know, he did talk about the referee and he said the referee wasn't the reason we we lost the match. But let's just hear from him. And that was that was frustrating that um, that we've not showed the real guile and quality to um, to create a chance. But I say for the for the chances that we did, because it wasn't a game of loads of chances, was it? You know, it um, um, it, it was. Not really much in in the game, and at times, you know, it was a little bit bit frantic, which we didn't want today against Everton. You know, we we wanted to be playing with control and uh, building up well, and really sort of designing our way up the up, up the pitch. And in the initial start of the game, we we showed that a bit, but then um, with the balls come in and picking up and adding, can lose a little bit of control and momentum in the game, and and we sort of played up to that. It was a little bit you have the ball, we have the ball, and vice vice versa, where where we didn't really want it to make it that game. Okay. Um... Adam, any thoughts on on what the manager had to say there? I think the thoughts come back to what we've said. That he wants to play the right. He wants to play this brand of football. He wants to play this controlling brand of football of being at home and being the better side. But like we say, for some reason, and we we, we can put it down to whatever reason we want, but for some reason that's not working. Um, I think Cooper, if I was to give him some criticism, would be it's your job on the training ground. And then for the match day to make it work. If that's the way you want to play and that's the way that you want us to set up, then do it. And that, you know, implement that strategy. Because if at the moment, this new style of football, we've seen glimpses of it. You know, we saw glimpses at Palace. We saw glimpses at um, West Ham away. You know, we, we've seen glimpses. We saw it against Villa. Where Where's that performance gone? That wasn't long ago. You know, we, we have seen it. But it's not on a consistent basis. So how do we get it on a consistent basis is probably the hardest thing that he's now got to deal with. Mm, OK. Of course, naturally, the, the press are are saying that Cooper is under pressure. Now, I had a chat with uh, our friends, again, our sp- sports social stable mates, Anfield Rap, the other day, and they were asking about the pressure. And I was saying, to be honest, as far as I can tell, a lot of the pressure is just coming from journalists saying, well, Cooper must be under pressure because of who our owner is. There's not been that much concrete stuff where, reading between the lines, I'm not seeing it being the case that that Cooper is under huge amounts of pressure, especially as John Percy, who is someone who's obviously close to the ownership, did write the other day saying Cooper's not under that much pressure, but Maranakis wants to get a set piece coach in. Now, Maradona, yesterday you were talking to your 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 good showbiz mate, Max Rushton on Talk Sports, and um and you were making a very similar point, weren't you? And 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 talking about the idea about, well. Where have we come from? Where are we going? And before I come to you, Maradona, I'd just like to uh, read out this uh, tweet, which was from Forest Fanbase on the um, on on their own feed. So we had the ultimate football manager, and we had decades of trying to find another. Right now, we have a guy who's achieved more than anyone's wildest dreams, and he's solved all kinds of incredible transitional challenges thrown at him time after time. We lose three games strewn with individual errors and dodgy decisions, and do you think he's the problem? Is this Forest the serial winners being dragged down by a championship level manager or is it a club turned around almost single handedly by a widely respected boss that we have to thank our lucky stars ever stepped through the door? Um, Maradona, I think you feel quite similarly to Forest fan base, don't you? I did. Yeah, I made I made very similar points yesterday. Um, I mean, any, any manager in the Premier League, if they've only won one game in 10 matches, is going to be under pressure. That's just the nature of the beast now. Um, but if you take that snapshot and uh, make all your decisions on that, you're going to be doomed to failure. Um, you're going to keep on repeating the mistakes of the past. What you've got to do is take a longer term picture. Some Somewhere like Forrest has to have a look of maybe a five year time span. So he's maybe in the middle of that. I think if we, if we stick with him for another two, three years, we will be a comfortable mid-table top half Premier League football club. 
because he, not only does he, is he a good football manager, but he, he runs the club in the right way. Mm. He's, he's got the best interests of the club. We can bring in somebody else. Um, uh, and they, we, they might well win another three or four games in this season than Steve Cooper would. But that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be a better club in two, three or four years' time. Uh, most managers these days are are governed by short-termism because they're, they're going to get the sack if they, if they don't do well. So they don't have an interest in bringing through young players. They don't have an interest in, in developing uh, their own players. And if Boris are to be successful long-term, that's what we have to do. We can't afford to spend our way into the top half of the table because, one, we don't have the money, and two, FFP won't allow it. And so the only way we're going to progress as a club is if we develop our own players, if we bring them through. And there's nobody better in the country than Steve Cooper to oversee that. And Maradona, just very, very briefly. So you could say, you know, looking at exemplars, you could say, well, Brighton are an exemplar. And as people have pointed out, especially as Forest, as a, as a few Forest fans who say, oh, give Potter the job. Well, Brighton finished lower half of the of the Premier League quite consistently before he started to to get things clicking, and then and then he left. Um, but then the other potential exemplar are Brentford. Now, Brentford and Brighton are both examples of clubs who'd been run in a very stable way for many years before they got promoted. And then also the other thing that's worth pointing out is that Brentford don't actually have an academy. So just very briefly, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, the Potter one is ludicrous. If, if people are angry with Steve Cooper playing possession-style football now, we wait until Graham Potter steps through the door. It'll be, an, it'll be another level. Um, yeah, Brentford don't have an academy, but they do have a B team where they sort of hoover up uh, young players from other clubs, academies, and develop in that way. And then they have their uh, sister club in Denmark, uh, which is similarly similar to other clubs, sort of looks at players from throughout Europe. But they're both examples of bringing in sort of, and developing your own players and having people in place in the club who understand that. You could bring in Rafa Benitez next week and he might well win six games in a row and we might well finish ninth this season. And but we won't be a stronger club at the end of it for it. We'll be a weaker club, and then it will disrupt so much. It will disrupt the. What well, you'll have to get rid of all the coaches. He'll want to bring his own players. He'll have another turnover of players. We've been through this time and time again. As far as we, more than any other fan base in the country, should know the harm that changing managers quickly does to your club. Mm, OK, um, just a few opinions that we'd had via our Twitter feed at Nottingham underscore Forest. Uh, so uh, Beardo says it's the worst we've played this year. There's no pattern of play or idea of what we're trying to do. We just seem to try and get it up the pitch and hope someone did something. So certainly alluding to the, the lack of cohesion up front. Um, we also had. Who else did we have? He says. Uh, so uh, Beck said. Cooper put his job in the hands of Chris Wood instead of Origi, who has a track record against Everton. Why start Morgan Gibbs-White on the right when Callum hudson Adoy is a better out wide? Why only press when we're behind? Rubbish in big letters. And we also had um, David, who said, I'd say we were rubbish. He used a different word, but I'm not even sure that we're as good as that. We never win in December. Adam, briefly, any thoughts on those opinions? Um, the, the Chris Wood slide is confusing to me because is Chris Wood a good centre forward? No, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think he's great. However, what was he meant to do last night? What was he given last night? He's not a striker that's going to create his own chances. He's not a striker that's brilliant on the ball and he's going to drop deep, pick the ball up and then give it to the wingers and stuff. It's not that sort of player. Like, I feel for Chris Wood last night because he got so much stick and it's like, well, I don't know what you want him to do. The calls for Origi, you know, like a, for me, I, I think that's a ridiculous claim to ask Origi, Origi to come in and fix this. For one, he's clearly not fully fit. I think it's obvious to see that he's not fully fit. So he's got a proven track record. Yeah, but a lot of people have a true... How many times have we as Forest fans heard the set, heard that sentence proven track record and it's not worked at Forest. It's irrelevant what Origi's done in the past, in my opinion. He was a bench player for Liverpool who come on and scored important goals. He never started for Liverpool. 
right? It'd be be very rarely would you see Origi playing 90 minutes for Liverpool. Mm -hmm. So I do like Origi. And I thought at the time it was a smart signing to bring in somebody that is an option. Bear in mind, Tywo is going to be fit all season. He's going to be the number one. That's not a situation we're now in. In January, we have to sign a striker. But that for me isn't because Chris Wood is like some terrible player. I don't think he's fantastic. But I think if you give Chris Wood a bit of service, you give him the chances. I do think he scores. I do think he can put the ball in the back of the net if he's given that service. The point about Gibbs White is is correct. He shouldn't be playing out wide. He, it's, it's been seen time and time again that Gibbs White doesn't work out wide. The problem with that is, is that Cooper's got Dominguez, Sangare, Mangala, Danilo, Yates. He wants to fit all of them in the team. So he plays a three in midfield in the basis that you want Sangare is the six and then Dominguez and Mangala in front of him. It's not really worked out that way and it's not really successfully worked in that sense. So for me, you've got to, you've got to start with that four, two, three, one. You've got to. And I know people bemoan it saying, oh, it's this, it's that. Start with when Sangare is fully fit and fully healthy again, because he clearly wasn't last night. When Sangare is fully fit and healthy again, play Sangare and Mangala as the two and then play Gibbs White in the 10, because that's where he plays. That's his best position. Alanga and hudson Adoy out wide and get some service into your striker. Be it Wood, be it Origi, be it a new striker. Get some service into them. And you're going to see a massive, massive difference. This 4-3-3 is not going to work. It just isn't going to work with the personnel we have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it might it might work when Tywo's there, but not, not yeah, when exactly. he's not. So, um, and just... Very, very quickly, I'm going to ask your opinion about the Cooper uh, situation. Um, as I say, I'm just going to repeat once again, I've not seen anything particularly concrete to suggest that the club are thinking about it. I think it's press driven. Um, but of course, what it does, is it builds up a an air of what's of of what fans might expect and 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 it puts pressure on someone who's um who may not otherwise be under pressure but what i am just going to put to you very quickly adam as a closing gambit is that if forest were to um were to part with cooper then what that does is it presses the reset button and that's not always a good thing because it means that the next manager doesn't have the same collateral in the same way that cooper has proven that he can do a job at forest that next manager hasn't proven he can do a job at Forest, so you might end up in a cycle once again of someone being in post for six months, and then you get rid of them and you get a whole new coaching staff in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What do you think? I think as an ownership, you've got to ask yourself what you want this season, because that's the point. That's the point I want about this season. Yeah. If there's rumours and there's speculation flying around that Maranakis want a top ten this season, you know what? If that's the case, it will sack Cooper if we get beat by Fulham and Wolves. Right, that that that's the way it's going to work because we're not going to be in. The, we're not going to, be, you know, that that goal is not going to be met. If your goal is just to be established this season, to not get dra- dragged into a relegation battle, to finish fourteenth, fifteenth, like the last season, but just in a bit of a more comfortable way, then there is absolutely no point in sacking Cooper, none whatsoever, because he can achieve that this season. We can achieve 13th, 14th, whatever, and be nowhere near a relegation battle. I believe that Cooper can get this group of players to do that. They've got to ask themselves what they want. If you sack Cooper, you have to have a good manager to bring in. Um, It felt in the ground that the crowd turned a bit last night, but I've been there when Philip Montagnier is in the dugout and when Warburton's in the dugout and and Hewton, this long list of managers are in the dugout. And it did not turn even 10% of what it did back then. So there was a little bit of anger. There was a little bit of frustration. But the shouts of Lopetegui coming in. If Julian Lopetegui wants the Forest job and comes in, you've, everything's got to be right for him. And you've saw, seen that at Wolves. If he doesn't get the money he wants, if he can't bring in the players that he wants to bring in, if he can't have his own way, it, it's not. It's a recipe for disaster. If you give him everything he wants, he's a fantastic manager and he did a really good job at Seville. But you've, you've got to ask, there's so many variables to it that people think just sacking the manager is going to fix all of our problems. It isn't. I'm not saying I'm Cooper in. I'm not saying I'm Cooper out. What I'm saying is you've got to ask yourself all of them questions and the, only the ownership can do that. If he, got, if he got sacked tomorrow, I would be absolutely gutted just because I love the bloke and I want him to be forest manager for the next 30 years if we're successful and if he can progress the team. 
But if we, if, and in the same way, if we stay, stay with him and we get dragged into relegation battle and we have a bad season, I would still stick with him because I think that he can generate some more out of this team. It's probably one of the biggest decisions that ownerships had to make in probably Forest history. Mm. I'm just going to finish off uh, to say thank you very much to Maradona. Thank you to Adam. Um, Maradona did make the point uh, yesterday on Talk Sport, talking to uh, Max Rushton, that if nothing else, it's just exhausting. If we win, Cooper's the best thing since sliced bread. If we lose, he's taken us as far as he can go. It just gets really tiring going through that same cycle uh, all the time. So thank you to both of our pundits. Thank you very much to Fan Hub and to Sports Social and to Green King Sport for supporting us. If you've enjoyed what you hear, then please support us. If you can leave us a review or rate us on your podcast app, then that'd be great. If you can't do that, then share us on social media. If you can't even do that, then just tell your forest supporting mates that you like our podcast. And you can find all of our links at 1865.football. We'll be back after the Fulham match when hopefully we'll have some better news. And I want to say that, uh, you know, We've been in worse positions. We've lived very recently through over 20 years of Forest being considerably worse than they are now, um, which is some points away from the Premier League relegation zone. So maybe we could all just remind ourselves of that. Keep a bit of perspective. Keep a bit of faith. Thanks for listening. Podcast Network. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Forward, prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.